Are you are you checking uh, Campis in the YouTube? I don't see anything. In the YouTube, you okay? Now it's it's going to YouTube. All right, Camps, you can start presenting, Chris. Hello, everyone. We are back. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Christina. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us and uh, uh, giving you a bit of your time to uh, give this uh, interesting talk, I'm sure. Uh, Christina is uh, like Gustavo, Seamus and me, a uh, former Greenie, which means that she uh, worked with uh, uh, Doug Green. Uh, and with the advantage that she worked uh, while Doug's Green Lab was in uh, San Diego, California. I went to Memphis. So uh, Cristina Munoz Pinedo uh, is the leader of the cell death and metabolism group at EDBL in Barcelona, Spain. She graduated in biology in the University of Sevilla, and she started her scientific career in the field of cell death and cancer metabolism under the supervision of Dr. Abelardo Lopez Rivas, at the CSIC in Granada, Spain. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Granada in 2001 after several short stays in international labs. And then she moved to San Diego and worked with, uh, under the supervision of the Green at the La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology, where she studied the role of the mitochondria during cell death as uh, the, initiation, the initiator of uh, the apoptotic process and as a victim of uh, the caspase activation during this process. After a short stay in St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee in 2006, she moved, moved back to Spain to start a lab at Oncobel, the cancer department of Edibel. She was appointed in 2018 as an adjunct professor of the University of Barcelona. And her uh, lab's interest is to understand why and how cells die when deprived of nutrients and how nutrients and metabolic stress influence the communication between lung cancer cells and the immune system. So Chris, again, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, and uh, it's up to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, and uh, thank you, Gustavo, and, and Karina for letting me be virtually in Brazil. And uh, as the previous speaker said, I'd much rather be there, but uh, it's not possible. So um, I will start talking about uh, cell death and, and cancer. So. Thanks to the previous introduction, I will not, uh, to the previous um, introductory lecture, I won't have to go into much detail about uh, cell death, but I hope you learn a little bit about uh, the relevance of cell death in cancer. This is uh, my institute. Uh, the institute where we work is Oncobel, and uh, Oncobel is the cancer department of EDBEL, and this is the um, the uh, a hospital in the beautiful city of Barcelona. And you're welcome to visit or join us uh, for a also maybe. So um, this is the, gonna be the, this is the outcome, uh, the, the outline of the talk in which I will be presenting um, uh, whether apoptosis or other forms of cell death are involved in cancer development and also in cancer progression and especially uh, in therapy. So we will learn a little bit about different cancer, cancer therapies because the uh, therapy aims to induce cell death in the tumor cells. Um, this will be a first block about half an hour, then a second block uh, about the BCL2 family proteins in cancer development uh, and the BCL2 family proteins in therapy and also how we can target directly the BCL2 family proteins uh, with uh, drugs like venetoclax. 
In the third part of the talk, I would uh, mention other forms of cell death that have relevance in cancer. And uh, la the last block, especially since you're more interested in immunology, would be cell death in, in immunotherapy, in cancer immunotherapy, and immune evasion that accompanies uh, tumor formation. So uh, I'll probably make a, a, a take a break after each of these blocks so we can have some questions. Um, and so we don't have everything at the end because you're, uh, it's difficult to keep attention in a, in a talk like this. So here are the hallmarks of cancer in the uh, famous review by Hanahan and Weinberg uh, published in the year 2000. It's known for a very long time that uh, cancer cells are cells that become self-sufficient in growth signals. Um, that means that they have mutation in genes that makes them uh, grow more uh, and grow uh, even when they don't have uh, a stimulus that helps them to grow. On the other hand, we have insensitivity to anti-growth signals, meaning that signals like, for instance, uh, uh, having another cell next to it would promote, uh, uh, um, would let a cell stop growing, uh, tumor cell would not have that signal. It would be insensitive to this type of signal. On the other hand, a hallmark of cancer is tissue invasion and metastasis, which means that the tumor that originated in a site is now disseminating, is now going all around the body and finding different niches. And usually it's the metastasis uh, what kills the, uh, the patient. Not always, but metastasis is, a, is a really important. Another hallmark of cancer is that they have, uh, these cells have endless replicative potential. They can replicate uh, uh, and they don't have a limit which normal cells do. Um, sustained angiogenesis, another hallmark of cancer. And this was put in here very early on. It's the hallmark of evading apoptosis. So evading apoptosis is one of the characteristics uh, of cancer. Hanahan and Weinberg uh, published uh, a, a second uh, review, more recent, where they showed some emerging hallmarks of cancer and uh, a new one, which is actually really, really old, is the deregulation of cellular energetics. It's known as the Warburg effect, and I'm not gonna talk about it today, but it's also an important feature of cancer. And of course, they forgot in the year 2000 that avoiding this immune destruction is essential for, um, for a cell to become a tumor. So uh, uh, preventing cell death by the immune system is uh, a feature of cancer. Then we also have some enabling characteristics like tumor promoting inflammation, which is related to, to the immune system and genome instability and mutation that uh, facilitates all the other hallmarks because these cells are prone to mutate and so acquire new uh, oncogenic mutations or, they, or the loss of tumor suppressors. So an oncogene is a protein that when it's mutated will uh, promote uh, proliferation or other uh, hallmarks of cancer uh, or prevent cell death. A tumor suppressor is a protein that when uh, it loses its function, then it's when you promote uh, proliferation. So oncogenes and tumor suppressors, oncogenes are generally activated and tumor suppressors are inactivated in cancer. So um, as uh, Seamus has shown beautifully earlier, uh, tissues uh, need uh, homeostasis and the homeostasis uh, goes because there's a balance between the new cells and uh, the cell death. And there are tissues which much more uh, uh, occur as those new cells because the tissue is constantly renewing, like uh, tissues of the epithelium or the immune system, which is constantly proliferating and then uh, dying. Um, in the other on the other hand, uh, we can have an imbalance in cell death and there are uh, plenty of diseases that occur when we have this imbalance. Some of them when we have too much cell death could be uh, neurodegeneration, for instance, there are, there are several um, diseases due to loss of, of neurons, too much death. Uh, but there are also a couple of diseases in which uh, there's too little cell death. 
And the most important of these two uh, diseases are cancer and autoimmunity. And in fact, you'll see that there are some uh, parallelisms between cancer and autoimmunity that, uh, that are similar in many of the regulators. So um, apoptosis is at the, the core of cancer development, is uh, linked to cancer development. Um, this we know because tumors overexpress anti-apoptotic proteins, uh, which be, uh, become um, behave like uh, oncogenes, and they reduce uh, the levels or present mutations in pro-apoptotic proteins, which usually behave as tumor suppressors. So um, this occurs because there's a lot of moments uh, in which a, a cell uh, should die. And for instance, uh, um, a cell that is damaged, which is, would be a cell of an epithelium, let's say, um, in the skin, a cell that receives uh, too much ultraviolet light, too much UV light, it needs to be eliminated. Uh, it's programmed to be eliminated to maintain the genomic, the integrity of the genome, to prevent uh, mutations to accumulate. So DNA damage should induce apoptosis. On the other hand, uh, growth factor deprivation in some cells is it, uh, what it triggers just uh, to cells to stop growing, but in many other cases, it does induce apoptosis. Uh, there are other uh, situations in which uh, cells should die, for instance, if they detach from the matrix, which is an event that occurs before cells invade and, and go on to other tissues to start the metastasis. Um, and this should induce apoptosis. Of course, the immune response against, against tumors should induce apoptosis. And uh, there's uh, something important and less known, and is the oncogenic activation. The activation of oncogenes per se uh, triggers apoptosis, and this we know uh, in vitro and in vivo. So um, let's uh, look at how different uh, cells uh, would behave uh, uh, in our body uh, when they suffer damage or oncogenic uh, activation. We have uh, three major, uh, and there are more, types of cells in our body. Uh, the cells of the epithelium, of the epithelia, um, cells in uh, our mesenchymal, uh, in mesenchymal cells like uh, muscle cells or like adipocytes, and we have immune cells. There's, of course, neurons, there's a, a few more. But these are uh, three major types of cells that are uh, these ones and this one are very prone, uh, Seamus said earlier, to proliferate. And so they're um, also very prone to suffer DNA damage because they're constantly proliferating and mitosis uh, engages damage, but uh, also because they suffer a lot of uh, external damage, uh, for instance, um, uh, pathogens and, and certainly environmental damage like like um, like when we breathe uh, cells in the lung uh, or when we smoke uh, cigarettes, they get a lot of damage and this damage would be um, DNA damage. And uh, just by getting environmental damage or just by because replication is not perfect, you can have a mutation in a gene that is an oncogene. And if this gene uh, gets hyperactivated, for instance, PA3 kinase, for instance, RAS, for instance, uh, uh, a growth factor receptor. Uh, when it's hyperactivated, we know that the cell will die. It will either, oncogene activation or DNA damage triggers apoptosis, or also in some cases, senescence, like cells are irreversibly um, arrested. And I will go over senescence a little bit at the end. So if uh, some of these things that is constantly happen in our body is um, not occurring because uh, cell death cannot occur, cell death uh, doesn't block, you may end up accumulating a lot of cells that have genomic uh, damage and that have an oncogenic activation. So this leads to a tumor and uh, these are three of the major types of, of tumors uh, that we find. The, the major killers are the epithelial tumors. And here we have like a lung cancer, liver cancer, breast 
colon cancer, which are 80% of the, of the cases of, of cancer, and they are the, as I said, the major killers in the world. Uh, if it's a mesenchymal cell, we end up with a sarcoma, which are very uh, minoritarian, but very, very difficult to treat. And if it's an immune cell, uh, it would lead to a leukemia or a lymphoma, which uh, thank goodness we're getting into being able to, to treat but some of the leukemias and the lymphomas are impossible to treat, but uh, the, the field is moving very rapidly. So these are the three, three types of major types of cancer, and they're all due to oncogene activation and uh, also to uh, avoidance of cell death. So oncogene activation leading to cell death is somehow uh, um, difficult, there's a concept that is difficult to grasp because we know generally that oncogenes um, are anti-apoptotic proteins. And if we think of the major oncogenes like PI3 kinase and AKT, and we know them as inhibitors of apoptosis. We know that they are pro-survival proteins. Uh, so um, how is it that a pro-survival protein, when the signal is tonic, when the cell has gotten used to be this hyperactivated oncogene, should induce apoptosis. Well, when the signal is tonic, indeed, these, uh, these oncogenes um, usually regulate cell death and, and prevent cell death. Now, when the signal is acute, like in the moment of transformation, let's imagine we in, we mutates RAS and introduces it into a cell, or when we hyperactivate MYC, this ends up in cell death. So the same pathways that can be pro-survival in a cell are actually pro-apoptotic in a non-transformed cell. So the oncogenes are pro-apoptotic about transformation, then they become proteins that uh, regulate survival, that promote survival. But, it, but initially they promote apoptosis. Now, we know that mutations in apoptotic genes are involved in tumorogenesis, they are involved in metastasis, and they are involved in resistance to therapy. For instance, T53, which is a, a common, well-known tumor suppressor, is uh, frequently mutated. P53, uh, one of its main roles is to induce apoptosis. On the other hand, we know that anti-apoptotic genes of the bcl 2 5 protein are frequently overexpressed in tumors and that we have mutations in the pro ones. We also find reduced levels of cast resistance on tumors and some amplifications in IAPs. I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about AIPs, IAPs today. There was a question earlier, uh, but there are some amplifications in IAPs and IAP antagonists have been proposed to be uh, drugs, uh, good drugs against cancer. And we'll probably hear about IAPs uh, in the talk uh, by Donagoy uh, on Friday. So what is apoptosis? We've had already a, a long talk about apoptosis, but I'll give you my view. It, uh, it used to be a, a defined as programmed cell death, but we have a lot of programmed cell death, or forms of programmed cell death. So I would say that the current definition of apoptosis is rather caspase dependent cell death that unlike pyroptosis, which is also caspase dependent cell death, it doesn't harm tissues because it doesn't cause inflammation. And here I would take the, um, the idea of, of Seamus that executioner caspases, what they do is to prevent inflammation. So uh, apoptosis would be a caspase dependent cell death that doesn't promote inflammation. If anything, it reduces it. So there are morphological and biochemical features that, of apoptosis that depend on the executionary cast basis, such as membrane blebbing, cell detachment, uh, shrinkage, chromatin condensation, all of this depends on cast basis. There are uh, features like the DNA ladder that we've seen earlier, sub-G1 DNA content that allows us to measure it by the flow cytometry, or phosphatidyl serine exposure. Now, there are um, several pathways that uh, lead to apoptosis. 
And uh, there are other forms of cell death. So briefly, uh, there's necroptosis that depends on the weak kinases and also on the uh, death ligon. And we'll see a lot of this in the talk by Peter van den Neville. We have pyroptosis, which we will see in a lot of detail in the talk by Peter Brock. Uh, and uh, apoptosis, which has two main pathways, the death, the death receptor pathway and the mitochondrial pathway and the grand sign pathway, which I will mention later. Um, so the phases of apoptosis, if we look at them under the microscope with a fluorescent microscope, we can see that the uh, cytochrome C is in the mitochondria. We're assuming this is the mitochondrial apoptosis. And in the, the stimulus either activates this receptor or in the case of mitochondrial apoptosis, deactivates survival pathways. And there's a decision phase, a uh, point of no return, which uh, in this case, you can see a cytochrome C being released from the mitochondria because uh, there has been a regulation of BCL2 family members that have led to the cytochrome C release of the mitochondrial permeabilization. Then there's an execution phase that you can see here, but this pink, which is an exin that binds to the membrane. By this point, the apoptosome has formed, the caspase activation has occurred, and the cell starts to disintegrate, DNA starts to degrade. DNA is here in blue, um, uh, like it's propidium iodide. And this, you should have not seen this in vivo because phagocytosis would have already occurred. So there, you would not observe this uh, in vivo because a macrophage or a neighboring cell would have eaten the apoptotic cell. If we look at this in a movie that I cannot put on because uh, this uh, marker doesn't allow me to, um, then no, how can I go back? So, I would like to play this movie. Here we go. Uh, cytochrome C is inside the mitochondria, and at some point it goes like pop popcorn. All cells release it. And then anexin binds, and then very quickly afterward, the cell becomes permeable with propidium iodide. Uh, we're going to see it again. Um, this is an overnight movie. So the time that passes between the annexin uh, binding to the cell and the propidium iodide incorporation is not as long as in the jerk cuts that we see uh, that we saw in the previous presentation. Here's annexin binding. Here's the uh, incorporation of propidium iodide. But there is a certain time that could be between half an hour and two hours, depending on the cell, uh, in which cells are still positive for annexin and, and still impermeable. They don't, uh, you cannot get propidium iodide inside the cell. But this could be a very quick process and also in vivo. This could happen in, in, in one hour. Since the moment a cell decides to die, releases the cytochrome C and the, mem the mitochondrial membranes are permeable until uh, the cell is uh, eliminated. And this is why for so many years, decades, centuries, uh, Nobody could see cell death in vivo. Now, uh, what do uh, caspases do? Caspases are the proteases that, um, that uh, execute cell death. And uh, as Seamus has already seen, I'm going to go into this in with a lot of detail. They dismantle the cell by cleaving hundreds of proteins. There's not a single um, caspases, uh, caspase substrate that is responsible for cell death. So caspases, when they're engaged, they alter uh, all the functions of the cell. And uh, they uh, dismantle the cell in a way that is, not, uh, that is not inflammatory. The membrane is kept uh, um, intact until very late in the apoptotic pro uh, process. So what are caspases? Uh, again, as uh, uh, Seamus explained this in a bit of detail. We have uh, three groups of caspases. We focus in apoptosis on the executioner caspases. 
and they are initiator uh, apoptotic caspases like caspase um, eight and uh, caspase nine that are activated by homodimerization. In at uh, during cell death, there are at least two different complexes that activate initiator caspases that are the disc the, uh, that is activated in response to dead ligands and that activates caspase eight like this, like the pro-caspase uh, binds to another pro-caspase, the death ligands bring the caspases together and this leads to the mature caspase. And the apoptosome, which we have seen earlier in a lot of detail, the, the apoptosome in flies and, and mammals and in, in C. elegans. So uh, after this, then the phagocytosis occurs and apoptotic cells are removed by macrophages. And uh, we have seen this earlier. And here is a, a review actually by Seamus's group in which they describe how apoptotic cells are removed by macrophages and the proteins that, uh, involved, that are involved in this removal. So uh, the outcome of this is that apoptosis is anti-inflammatory while regulated and unregulated forms of necrosis are pro-inflammatory. For instance, necroptosis and pyroptosis are pro-inflammatory. Now there's a big question here uh, for cancer researchers, and is that we don't know whether we prefer the cells to die in an anti-inflammatory way or in a pro-inflammatory way. So it's a question that I'm gonna be raising several times because it may depend on what we want to achieve. If we want to kill a tumor, most importantly, we want to kill itself, right? But besides killing the cells, we are still not sure whether we would prefer to kill them in a very, um, in a very inflammatory manner because inflammation is not good uh, for some tissues, but on the other hand, this kind of inflammation can attract the immune system. And in some cases, the tumors don't have the immune system active around because they haven't detected it. So it's possible that we uh, should induce some inflammation in order to engage the immune system to attack uh, the tumor. Um, this is something that James has already shown. I was going to tell you a little bit about the development of C. elegans, but since you've seen it beautifully before, I'll skip this part. So there are two major, um, two major pathways to apoptosis. One is the extrinsic pathway and the other one is the intrinsic or mitochondrial pathway. The extrinsic pathway is induced by uh, three proteins which are fast ligand, TNF and trail, which are cytokines. And uh, it plays a role uh, in, in the body, mostly in the elimination of infected cells in the immune system, homeostasis of the immune system and immune privilege. And also this pathway plays a role uh, in inflammation. So these signals are also inflammatory signals. So there's a non-apoptotic function of these proteins. The intrinsic of mitochondrial pathway is engaged by everything else that you can think that induces apoptosis. So pretty much everything, including the majority of uh, drugs that kill, kill cancer. So for instance, hormones can induce apoptosis, the lack of growth factors, the hypoxia, hypoglycemia, the lack of nutrients uh, and the metabolic therapy. Chemotherapeutic drugs, the classic type, the ones that induce DNA damage and the ones that don't. Other anti-tumor drugs like the targeted therapy, uh, moderate damages uh, of motic type or heat shock type, DNA damage, uh, detachment, oncogene activation, you name it. So uh, almost everything kills through the mitochondrial pathway. So in cancer, there's a, a very big relevance of the mitochondrial pathway. And here's uh, the, the main uh, picture of how the two pathways uh, relate. One is induced by the death receptors that then uh, bring the protein FAD and caspase 8, and the caspase 8 then uh, either directly engages caspase 3 or cleaves dead that then cross 
talks with mitochondrial pathway. The mitochondrial pathway is induced by BCL2 family proteins that then make pores in the mitochondrial membrane, cytokine C is released, and this triggers the formation of the apoptosome and caspase 9. And then executional caspases are activated. So uh, caspases are what's common between, uh, between the two pathways. And caspases sometimes are mutated or even downregulated in tumors. We know that tumor cells uh, evade apoptosis. And when we look at the specific caspases and uh, we sequence tumors and look at specific caspases, we see some downregulation of caspase one in tumors. So caspase one is not a pro-apoptotic uh, caspase. It's actually an inflammatory caspase. We also can find some polymorphisms in caspase eight uh, and some mutations in caspase eight and, and caspase 10. And we can see some mutations in colon cancer, uh, uh, for instance, some mutations of caspase three uh, and some mutations of caspase seven. So these were experiments, uh, these findings were done years ago. And I think we can now say that caspases are really not that important for cancer development. Uh, that if you inactivate caspases, uh, it's, this is not going to be sufficient to produce a tumor or to help a tumor. Um, so possibly all these findings uh, relate to the fact that there's loads of mutations in cancer. So you are going to find mutations almost everywhere. And this polymorphism, we don't know what it means. Uh, possibly it's related to the fact that caspase 8 is involved also in inflammation. Um, and in fact, if we look at the, at the phenotypes of the knockout uh, mice of caspases, we find, for instance, in the case of caspase 1, mice develop normally. Uh, well, let's focus on the, on the yellow ones that are the apoptotic caspases. Uh, yeah, in the apoptot in the case of caspase 3, yes, we have a tiny, uh, a little bit of hyperplasia, but there's very little lethality. And caspase 3 mice are, are viable. Caspase 8 has embryonic lethality. Caspase 9 has a little bit of uh, excess of brain tissue, but we don't see tumors arising in, in these knockouts. So um, I'm going to argue for this and uh, reason, and uh, because in the in the lab, we know that when we inhibit caspases, cells are going to die anyway. They're going to, it's going to take longer, but cells are going to die anyway. That caspases are not that relevant uh, for cancer development. Although we absolutely see caspases uh, being cleaved and activated uh, by therapy. So apoptosis and actually cell death is indeed the main outcome of cancer therapy. Uh, so let's see what kinds of cancer therapies we have. On one hand, we have uh, chemotherapy, which is the classical way to treat tumors. For chemotherapy, we have a, a number of compounds, compounds that could be the, the classical methotrexate, 5-FU, and some antimetabolites that prevent uh, replication. They're anti-mitotic uh, compounds. We also have inhibitors of topoisomerases like atropocyte, doxorubicin. These ones are anti-mitotic as well. There are some alkylating agents and, and some other classical anti-mitotics like uh, Taxol. That uh, all that they do, this, uh, this chemotherapy does, is to prevent cells from replicating, but it also kills the cells induce apoptosis. Now, chemotherapy induces death in the tumor cells, but it also induces death of non-tumor cells. And this is why we have all these side effects from uh, uh, immune de uh, depletion to uh, hair loss, uh, to many other effects of chemotherapy. Some of them are more toxic than, than the others. A second type to treat to treat tumors, and usually they go together to treat a patient, is radiotherapy. Radiotherapy consists in a high irradiation, sometimes it's localized, sometimes whole body, and these uh, kills 
uh, the cells, the tumor cells, sometimes in a very focalized manner. And some cells will die by apoptosis, but some cells will die by necrosis as well, because these, uh, the frequency can, can trigger necrosis as well, because um, it's too intense for cells to die by apoptosis and, and cells die quickly by necrosis. There is a third type that is a hormonal therapy that works with some hormone sensitive tumors like those of the breast, ovarian, prostate, uh, like tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, and many more uh, that are sensitive to the predation of some hormones or activation of, with some other hormones. Then there's a targeted therapy, which is the, the last generation of chemical, chemical compounds. Um, some of them are antibodies and some of them are small compounds that inhibit what we call the driver mutation of a tumor. A driver mutation could be an, uh, is an oncogene that is essential for a specific tumor. And for instance, in lung cancer, we have a lot of specific driver mutations like RAS. Um, or uh, we have uh, a lot of, of um, growth factors like uh, HER2 in, in, in breast cancer. We have a lot of driver mutations in, in some lymphomas. So there are specific compounds that inhibit those driver mutations. Well, all of these uh, therapies and immune therapy, which I will talk about at the end, all of them induce apoptosis and all of them induce cell death. That's the, the aim. There are very, very few specific cases in which a cancer therapy induces other outcomes, for instance, terminal differentiation of the cell, the majority actually induce apoptosis. Uh, so here are examples of many, many, many drugs that we are either developing or using against cancer that target each one of the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, and we have from uh, inhibitors of, of uh, proteins that are in the membrane of the cell, giving the cell uh, proliferative uh, signals. We have um, immune activation. We have anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, inhibitors of invasion and metastasis, inhibitors of angiogenesis, um, inhibitors of PARP that target the genome instability, and for sure the pro-apostotic BHC mimetics that I will talk in the second part, and inhibitors of metabolism, all of them induce cell death. All of them induce cell death. So what we want is to induce cell death in the cancer cell. And we can see that indeed apoptosis is the major type of cell death that is engaged in cancer because when uh, we analyze uh, mice treated with chemotherapy drugs, we see that uh, caspases get activated. It, uh, it's that simple. Control cells, for instance, in this case, we see a proliferation marker here, which is KISS 67. Uh, the brown cells are the ones that are dividing because they're positive for KISS 67. And in this case, we're treating with a glutaminase inhibitor um, uh, in combination with uh, another inhibitor of the same pathway. And uh, we see how the combination treatment in this case gives a lot of brown cells that are staying here for active caspase 3, for the cleaved caspase 3. So uh, we can see a lot of um, positive cells for caspase 3. That means that the cells have died by apoptosis. And uh, at the same time, we can see uh, signs of DNA damage. This DNA damage is caused by caspases. Uh, it's not the cause, but the consequences of apoptosis. So the majority of therapeutic drugs, even the, one, even the ones that inhibit metabolism, uh, and the majority of them kill via apoptosis. So here's the first part of the talk. We can take a one minute break if there are any questions or um, we can start with the, with the BCL2 family proteins. Uh, hi, Chris. There's yeah. a couple of questions already, but I think I'm gonna uh, ask one of those. Uh, all these anti-cancer drugs, as you 
you, you mentioned, induces apoptosis, which it was clear by now, by your presentation and Seamus's, that this is anti-inflammatory or has a much less impact on immune response than the necrotic uh, forms of regulated cell death. So shouldn't these drugs, anti-cancer drugs, be designed or something to induce this more a necrotic form of cell death, which may uh, also lead to this question about immunogenic versus non-immunogenic cell death, that will be a topic of uh, the whole lecture. But if you, if you care to comment a little bit on this right now, it would be great. Thank you. In my opinion, yes. Uh, but that's a super simplification, obviously, of the reasons. Um, yes, I think even if uh, the, uh, what we see is apoptosis, uh, when there's massive apoptosis in a tissue, there's not enough macrophages to eliminate all those uh, cells that are dying. And there's not enough neighboring cells to hit them because they're all dead. So the, when there's massive apoptosis, we'll end up with secondary necrosis, even in vivo, because uh, the, we cannot control all the apoptotic bodies that are being formed. There's not enough time to eat all of them and to eliminate them. So First, massive apoptosis will eventually lead to necrosis and will eventually lead to inflammation uh, in, in there if there's too much of it. Second, I, I think we need to stimulate the immune system and sometimes a little bit of cell death is the trick that allows the immune system to be engaged. And this is beautifully shown in some experiments in which some tumors are formed in uh, some ex in experimental animals They've uh, injected tumors in two flanks of the mice, and we can irradiate one side of the mice, and this would trigger regression of the tumor in the other side. And uh, we suppose uh, that this is because the death on one side has released new antigens or has somehow awakened the immune system to then be able to recognize the, the second side. The, uh, the antigens were there, possibly, but for some reason, the, tumor, the, the T cells were either allergic or uh, they, were, they were just not reacting to the, to the mutation. So I, th I think, yes, I think we need to induce some necrosis uh, in order to trigger pumps, uh, sorry, dumps or some. Thank you. Can I comment? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we need to bear in mind that um, all the existing chemotherapeutic drugs, more or less, were selected empirically for being good at killing cells. So if those empirical studies had have selected drugs um, that were good at inducing necrosis, we'd see them in the clinic. And bear in mind that things that induce necrosis are typically nasty. So I'd say, I mean, the big problem with chemotherapy is one, the patient tolerating the side effects of the drug. And I think most necrosis inducing compounds cause side effects that are unacceptable. So they effectively can't be used. And then obviously relapse, um, you know, is a big problem after the initial clearance of the tumor. But maybe, so, so clearly existing chemotherapeutics work very well in the main. We need to recognize that, you know, millions of patients are treated every year with conventional standard chemotherapy. It's something Tony Datai <clears throat> mentions all the time, you know? Like we, we always talk about targeted therapies and these magic bullets, but the conventional drugs that Chris mentioned that all induce apoptosis generally work very well. So maybe, you know, adding to those to at some point, you know, supplement or, or add to the probiotic effects, not necessarily completely switch. Because I think if you had a complete switch, the therapy would not actually be tolerated by the patient. You know, if you had a, a purely necrosis inducing drug, then I think that would have such big off target effects in terms of collateral damage of tissue that it, it, it probably wouldn't be something that you could treat a patient with, but maybe supplementing existing chemotherapeutics with low doses of things that maybe induces paraptosis or a program necrosis at some point in the therapy may produce those kind of advantages so I, I think it's kind of a complicated thing that it's not an either or. 
clearly all the existing probiotic regimes work very well, um, but to get them maybe to work a little bit better, it might be good to supplement them at some point in the in the treatment regime with maybe a you know a kind of a pinch of um, you know a paraptotic inducing compound or a necroptotic inducing compound. Radiotherapy. Radiotherapy does that. It's, pro it's probably what why radiotherapy and chemotherapy go so well together. Yeah. Sure. Because radiotherapy would uh, cause a lot of necrosis there. But we must remember like cancer therapies, you know, they, they do work pretty well. Yeah, which is chemo and radio. And those are the ones, now that uh, Seamus brought this up, uh, indeed, chemotherapy is really what cures patients. And I can give you the, the specific example of, of lung cancer in which uh, uh, targeted therapies, which are very fashionable, the directed towards uh, some oncogenes are, are really useful because they can prolong the life of patients but they don't cure. They don't cure any patient with lung cancer. The target therapy is the ones directed against the uh, kinases. Chemotherapy does cure a proportion of the, of the patients. And immunotherapy, which is now like the, the, the last miracle. All right, yeah. thank you. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead about the BCL2 family proteins. So first I'll talk about uh, how BCL2 family proteins are involved in cancer progression. The, what are the BCL2 family proteins? Were, well, as we've seen before, they are a family of proteins that are frequently on mitochondrial membranes. Some of them are soluble and many of them have a transmembrane domain, not uh, all of them by any means. There is a pool of pro-survival BCL2 family proteins. Uh, most famous of them are BCL2, MCL1, and BCLXL. And there is a pool of pro-apoptotic ones, uh, of which the best known are the two of them that are sitting in the membrane of the mitochondria or translocate to the membrane of, of the mitochondria, which are BAC and BAC. And BAC and BAC are the ones who form the pores in the mitochondria. As you'll see here, this little red square is the BH3 domain. The BH3 uh, by BCL2 homologue domain number three um, is the, what these proteins have in common. It's, and it's a tiny domain, it's not huge. So some of these proteins are very similar to each other like BCL2 to BCLXL. Uh, or to BAX and, and, and BAC and BOC. Many of them are very similar to each other. Now the BH3 only proteins, which is the third subset, are very different to each other. And uh, many of them, for many of them, we don't have a clear um, structure, how they look like, and they really have not much in common, but they do interact with each other. So, uh, drug advancing cancer. So if we don't have a, a pro-survival family member um, of BCL, uh, pro-survival pro BCL2 family member, like for instance, BCL2 itself, um, we get uh, abnormal cell death in many progenitors. And we always get some kind of effect on the immune system because the, immune, the cells of the immune system are the ones that are constantly dying, that the ones that are uh, very sensitive to having too much or to not having anti-apoptotic uh, proteins. And we we'll probably see Verena uh, Lavi explaining more details about the phenotypes of these, of these uh, mice. But if we don't have a pro-survival family member, uh, the animal usually dies, especially the MCL1, which is very, uh, which is critical for survival even of the embryo. If we don't have a Bax or BAC family member, uh, and there's a third one, which is BAC. Without Bax, we begin to see, we see some hyperplasia. With BAC, nothing happens. With the two of them, uh, with the knockout of the two of them, no, animals 
barely sur survive. Now, when we make neural animals of the BSC only proteins, in general, we have defects in the immune system. Now, if we overexpress these pro survival family members, we'll end up with cancer. This is how they work uh, on the mitochondria. We have BCL2 and other, uh, this is an example, BCL2, it could be BCL itself. And we have backs and back. They could be sitting on the outer membrane of the mitochondria. This is important. It has to be the outer membrane, not the inner membrane. Because cytochrome C is in here, it's in the inner, it's in between the two members in the intermembrane space. So backs and back are sitting in the outer membrane of the mitochondria and they can be sequestered by BCL2 uh, or the anti apoptotic ones. Then a, a BHC only protein comes in and it does two things. On one hand, it binds and removes the anti apoptotic like BCL2. And on the other hand, it directly binds back or back. So the outcome of this is that we release back and back and we have them active to make a pore in the outer mitochondrial membrane. And this uh, pore leads to fecundity that leads to the assembly of the apoptosome and then caspase 9 and apoptosis. So, the mode of action of how these proteins interact with each other has been studied uh, uh, in very much detail by a lot of groups. And we're still trying to find out the exact details because this is a crucial point that determines that a cell dies or doesn't die. So there are uh, different types of BHC proteins uh, and there is interaction between its members. And this is a super complicated uh, field that I'm not going to go into all the details of what is known because it, it's really a lot. Um, but we know that some BH3 proteins are more selective for some anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. And so, uh, for instance, uh, NOXA is more selective for MCL1, NOXA is a BH3 only, is more selective for MCL1, but you will see NOXA also binding to BCLXL. So, some of these experiments have been done in, in vitro, and uh, we know that the selectivity is uh, not as clear cut like in the experiments done uh, in 2030s a few years ago. But there is a certain selectivity of some BHC only proteins to some anti apoptotic ones. And this is the basis for the development of new drugs that can target the anti apoptotic ones. So, we know that BCL2 proteins are involved in cancer. First of all, we know this because BCL2 itself was discovered as an oncogene. It was discovered as a protein that was part of a fusion uh, in a hematopoietic uh, cancer in a lymphoma. And uh, all the, or most of the anti-apoptotic BCL2 family members behave as oncogenes. You have higher expression in a tumor and it can promote tumorogenesis while the pro-apoptotic BCL2 family members behave as tumor suppressors. So they are, they are clearly involved in cancer. Um, we can see this also in specific examples uh, and in very recent articles, for instance, this is from last uh, autumn um, by the lab of Felix Jost. We can see that MCL1, which is uh, one of the three main anti-apoptotic uh, proteins uh, um, is amplified in, in lung cancer. So this wasn't known. Uh, we usually think of BCL2 and BCLXL as the classical oncogenes, but MCL1 is also um, very frequently amplified and even is gained during tumor progression in lung cancer. So for instance, these researchers look at the different grades of tumorogenesis in lung cancer. And when they look at the grade one lung, uh, the different grades basically indicate whether the tumor is localized and resectable, that's grade one, then whether the tumor is still um, localized, but uh, almost invading in grade three, there's invasion of the of the lymph nodes near the tumor and in G4 there's dissemination 
of the, the tumor, which is already metastatic. So as, as a tumor progresses, if we find patients in different types, in different stages, we can see that MCL1 is amplified as we progress. Uh, they can find uh, uh, multiple copies of the gene as, as the tumor progresses. Uh, so uh, the, the tumor cells that had more BCL1, MCL1, sorry, that had more MCL1 became um, amplified because they were the ones they were the ones who survived most likely. It's not that they proliferate more, it's that they are the ones who survive, so they have more chances to to evolve into the, the next stage. So um, we can see that there's clonal and there are even subclonal gains, meaning that uh, uh, in, the, in individual lineages, uh, the tumors are heterogeneous, which is uh, terrible because we normally biopsy one side of the tumor, but we can have another side of the tumor that it has other different mutations. Uh, so they can see that all or not only in individual clones, but in different clones, there are gains uh, in animal models, there are gains of MCL1. So in this case, they also demonstrated that if we, you can target MCL1, you can reduce uh, the, the size of the tumor. In this case, this uh, an inhibitor of MCL1. So this was discovered uh, uh, last very, uh, very, not very long ago, and we're still constantly finding anti-apoptotic proteins that are involved in specific tumors. And this is an important area of research because we can now inhibit these molecules. So we could find, we could find a way to target selectively the, the resistant cells uh, in those tumors. These amplifications have been shown to occur in all sorts of ways. The amplifications of the anti-apoptotic BCL2 family have been shown to occur, uh, for instance, in the way that BCL2 was uh, described first uh, as a translocation uh, that uh, fuses the immune uh, region of the, of the locus of the immunoglobulins uh, with uh, BCL2. So we have a, a translocation that makes BCL2 overexpressed, amplification of the gene, like in the case of MCL1, this is very frequent. Simply overexpression at the level of mRNA, this occurs in cancer. And conversely, in the proapoptotic genes, we can find a genomic loss of the proapoptotic, we can find epigenetic silencing of the gene, and we find mutations. And uh, this will make them more resistant to therapy and more prone to progress to, to worse grades. Now, we can see that all the BCL2 family uh, and all the anti-apoptotic family members, not only BCL2, BCL, XL, and MCL1, all of them allow tumorogenesis by, by CIMIC. In this case, it was a lymphoma, I believe in this experiment. So I don't know, uh, it, 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 this is known for lymphomas and also for myeloma. So for the majority of hematopoietic tumors that are uh, derived so usually from an immature uh, B cell or T cell or an immature granulocyte, uh, you can uh, make a tumor by simply overexpressing an anti-apoptotic uh, cancer, uh, an apoptotic uh, gene of the b cell family member in conjunction with an oncogene, like in this case, MIC. So if we can see the relative survival uh, after the transplant of these cells, you can see that MCL1 allows the mice, um, the, allows us the cells to survive for longer. This is not the mice, this is the cells. Um, no, sorry, I'm confused, I'm all, all over again. No, this is the survival of the, of the animals with MIC only. This is the survival of the animals uh, when you overexpress an antibiotic protein. They survive much less. In this case, BCL2 is, uh, is more relevant than the others, and BCLW as well is more important. So, anti apoptotic BCL2 expression together with MIC uh, makes the cells die really, really fast, makes the mice die really, really fast. And in, in, in human tumors, we can see overexpression of all of them. We can see overexpression of BCL2 in breast, for instance. 
we can see other expression of MCL1 in lung and, and in others, or expression of BCLXL in ovarian cancer, and all of them in hematopoietic tumors, really. This is the same, but uh, in a list. Now, so apoptotic proteins of the BCL2 family, like BAX, BAX, BOC, BS3 only, are frequently mutated or downregulated in human tumors. And we have loads of examples here. Now, the BCL2 family problem, proteins are not only involved in cancer formation, but they determine the response to the therapy because the majority of therapies target the mitochondrial pathways. So, um, for instance, therapies that activate the, the tumor suppressor P53 end up in NOXA and Puma uh, transcription, and this leads to apoptosis. So uh, in gamma irradiation at low level that induces apoptosis, and this depends on P53, uh, this will depend on the levels of pro-apoptotic proteins that are induced. And the trick would be to know which anti, which pro-apoptotic protein, which PCL2 uh, family member, which BHC only protein is activated in response to which thermotherapy and in, in which type of cells, if we want to target this. And if we want to, to be able to predict which tumors are going to survive the chemotherapy or they're not. And we have a lot of experiments that have been done by a lot of researchers that have led to many conclusions, like for instance, BIM is engaged by uh, targeted therapy or by Taxol, a very used chemotherapeutic agent, or by HTAC inhibitors, which are a new chemotherapeutic uh, therapy, or by uh, corticosteroids that are used from some hematopoietic cancers. So the presence of BIM can predict whether this tumor is going to, to respond or not to the chemotherapy. Um, this BEM is just an example, but uh, this has been studied for uh, all of the BCL2 proapoptotic members. And uh, we know now a lot of how specific therapy engages a certain uh, BHC only protein. Now, I hope that Serena Lavi explains to you this unsolved problem, which is a bit of a mystery. And it's it that in the, we think that the anti apoptotic proteins like PCL2 are pro tumorogenic, but there are some cases, and it's actually her own experiment with Andrea Fillinger, in which pro apoptotic proteins such as Puma and Noxa contribute to lymphomogenesis. And this mystery is far from being solved, but uh, we can see that. Uh, that this occurs that if the tumors, uh, if the cells lose puma, uh, we have less tumors. Uh, puma uh, contributes to lymphomogenesis. So this is a mystery that uh, that will be solved, and uh, also the mystery that some BHB only proteins are upregulated in tumors. But this uh, this will take a while, and this only occurs in the in irradiation induced lymphomogenesis as far as we know. So we want to engage test pathways. So we want, uh, there are a number of drugs that have been designed to specifically inhibit BCL2 proteins. And this as a strategy to so directly engage cancer cell death. And these are the drugs like venetoclaxone similar. So, What's venetoclax? Venetoclax is a, a story of success for the cell death field. It's a drug that was designed to inhibit BCL2 by uh, researchers that were doing basic research on, on, on cell death. And uh, it's approved now for uh, CLL, which is a chronic leukemia, so a hematopoietic tumor, and AML, which is uh, another uh, hematopoietic tumor. And it's not only approved, but it's in very much in use, and it's been uh, incredibly successful for the treatment of this previously uncurable uh, disease, which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So venetoclax is uh, an inhibitor of BCL2, 
And right now it's being they're being tested in, in 100 clinical trials, I think probably more, because uh, the uh, benetoclax is, um, has very little side effects and it targets directly VCLX cell and it's very uh, effective against some, some hematopoietic uh, tumors. Now, why can we use a BCL2 inhibitor and not have all our brain cells die? not our heart cells die or our skin cells die if they all need BCL2. And this is due to a phenomenon that is called priming. So inhibitors of BCL2 proteins work because the tumor cells are primed. This means that in a when in an unstressed cell, you have bugs and bugs sitting on the membrane happily, but in a cell that overexpressed an anti-apoptotic BCL2 protein, and um, we have bugs are and back are inactive uh, because of that anti-apoptotic BCL2 protein. Now, if you use a molecule that inhibits the anti-apoptotic protein, like a molecule like venetoclax, these cells that express a lot of BCL2 protein are the ones that are going to die. And this would release bugs or bugs from the BCL2 family, uh, from the BCL2 protein, and this would promote MOMP. This is difficult uh, to understand, but it has been demonstrated empirically. Uh, this is the, the way they work. If you overexpress anti-apoptotic BCL2 protein, this is sufficient to promote sensitivity to their inhibitors. It's the opposite that we would think uh, in the classical inhibitor uh, drug um, protein fashion. If you have more of the target protein, you will need uh, more of the, of the drug. But in, in this case, in the BCL2 family proteins, the more of the BCL2 protein that you have, the more sensitive they're going to be to the BX3 mimetic. And so this can be seen, for instance, if you would separate here uh, BCL2 low and BCL2 high uh, patients, uh, you can see that the cells of the BCL2 high patients are much more sensitive to venetoclax than the ones from the BCL2 low patients. And this is a still molecularly, this to me is a little bit difficult to, to understand, but this is the way it happens. And this is why a brain cell doesn't die with an anti-apoptotic BCL2 protein because it doesn't overexpress it in the first place. So the more you overexpress it, the more sensitive the cells are. Uh, uh, Venetoclax is not by any means the only BCL2 family inhibitor under development and under testing. We have many more. We have some that target BCL cell. We have some that target multiple uh, uh, BCL2 family proteins. We have some specific for MCL1, which are likely going to be a bit toxic uh, because MCL1 uh, is required for a lot of cells. But there's plenty of these, and now they're under multiple clinical trials, and uh, they're probably we're probably going to see them in the clinic much more. I think we can take a break now about BCL2 family proteins because this has been a lot of information. If there are any, any questions already? So Gustavo, if, you, if, if there are any questions about the BCL2 proteins, uh, I can have them now. There are again a couple of questions. Sorry, I think Karina uh, has one. I may have another one. Go ahead, I think, Karina. Okay. So Bruno asked in the chat, um, uh, so uh, comparing BH3 and ISMAC mimetics, which one is more promising for cancer therapy, in our opinion? In my opinion, uh, BH3 mimetics because, well, SMAC mimetics, I haven't really discussed. SMAC mimetics are proteins, uh, are drugs 
that target the inhibitors of apoptosis, so they would directly activate caspases. But we find out over the years that uh, these drugs um, act mostly on CIAPs and also CIAP, which are SMAC, uh, which are which are proteins that are not only involved in cell death, they are also involved in inflammation. So they they uh, not necessarily kill the cells by any means. Although some of them are being tested and in vitro they can kill the cell, it's still frankly unclear whether they do so by inducing apoptosis. By indu but uh, most of them is that um, they, they don't kill the cells and the side effects uh, are inflammatory are, are really bad. I think uh, Seamus knows a bit more about the SMAC mimetics and I know that they're not under use and uh, clinicians don't want to use them for cancer. They might want to use them for other things. And I suspect that this is what Domagoy is going to talk about on Friday. Um, and so you know, you want to talk about SMAC mimetics? Well, <clears throat> um, it goes back to the point earlier. About. I mean, we know that when I mean, you said it earlier, I said it in my talk, um, you know, caspases don't really dictate whether tumors die. Um, they really control the outcome in terms of apoptosis or necrosis. And um, we know that, you know, IAPS, um, especially XIP, mainly works downstream of mitochondria. So there would be very little benefit for a tumor um, overexpressing IAPs as a, as a kind of a cell death avoidance strategy. Um, now, the, the, the exception would be CIP1 and 2, which regulates ubiquitination and the death receptor pathways. And as Christina said, that affects both cell death as well as inflammation. So the bottom line is, I think BH3 mimetics are far, far more promising as um, therapeutics against cancer than SMAC mimetics. Because as Christina has talked about, the pro-survival BCL2 proteins are really the major checkpoint in cell death control um, for the vast majority of stimuli. And um, you know, mammalian cells don't really depend on IAPs. Um, tumors don't really overexpress IAPs. So there's no major pro-survival benefit for tumors in overexpressing IAPs. So I think as a result, um, neutralizing the pro-survival BCL2 family members are really the most promising by far um, anti-cancer drugs. All right, excellent. Well, please, if I may add uh, just a couple of points uh, at this point is that um, uh, so, how can we uh, relate the variation, the expression of the members of the BCL2 uh, with the resistance to cancer in, in general, or cancer be more malignant or not? Is that a true correlation? Because I, I'm asking that because uh, in some experimental approaches in the lab, you know, lots I, I see lots of people just say, "Oh, okay, this is a cancer that uh, expresses a lot of BCL2, so that's that's the reason why this is this cell line or this cancer is uh, you know more malignant." than another ones that has uh, less. And I, I don't think this is, is obvious. And together with this question, just coming back to your point of the how the BH3 mimetics work, uh, what happened with uh, other tissues, non-transforming tissues that has BCL2, high BCL2 expression? So far, uh, nothing. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, why is that correlation is very uh, strong uh, in the cancer cells, but doesn't seem to operate in the... It, it's very intriguing, but if, if we look at the, uh, the case of another inhibitor, not venetoclax, but or, or about, um, ay, AVT737 um, and 263 and avitoclax. Navitoclax that inhibit also BCLX cell, uh, you indeed have a strong uh, side effect, which is thrombocytopenia. So the platelet precursors 
do indeed suffer a lot when you when you inhibit PCLX cells. So some tissues do suffer more than others, but the tumors are always much more uh, much more sensitive. Um, with the ones that inhibit BCL2 and the ones that inhibit BCLX cell, I don't know whether with MCL1 we really have a chance. And uh, probably not. But I, uh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, just to, to add to Christina's point, um, no, I, I think of an answer to that, Gustavo. So, as Christina has mentioned and I mentioned, you know, when you get a tumor, you've got a lot of damage in the cells. And as tumors basically, uh, you know, grow and become more malignant, you accumulate more and more and more damage. And so in that case where you have an overexpression of a, of a BCL2 family protein, the cell needs that protein. It, it's, it's massively primed through all the damage it's accumulated through transformation. And it's only surviving because it's managed to solve that problem by becoming addicted to BCL2 or MCL1 or whatever. And so that cell then is uniquely vulnerable to the neutralization of that oncogene it's become addicted to. And I think that's the simple answer. Whereas if you have normal, healthy, untransformed tissue, those cells are, are, are basically very far away from being primed because they haven't accumulated all that stress and damage that a tumor. I mean, a tumor cell is a cell that's growing in an environment it just should not be growing in. And it's accumulated a massive amount of stress and damage that you know, clearly mitigates you know, every second of the day against survival. And so it's managed to solve that problem by, you know, becoming completely addicted and dependent on the overexpressed BCL2 family protein. So I think that um, essentially explains the conundrum why cells that overexpress BCL2 are uniquely vulnerable to the H3 memetics. And as to uh, the other question, whether having more BCL2 or MCL1 or BCLX cell would make, would be the reason why those cells are, are tumorogenic. Well, we are not at that level yet, but there are some bioinformatic uh, models in which uh, you, there is some predictability in some tumors. Uh, if you take into account the amount of BCL2, the amount of BCLX cell and the amount of, of certain other anti-apostotic and pro-apostotic proteins, that you can actually predict whether the cells would be sensitive or resistant to specific therapies, not whether the tumor would be more um, or less uh, tumorogenic, but whether they would be resistant or not. This is uh, Jocelyn Bren and Marcus Bren are doing a lot of work about this, and it's actually very interesting because it works. They can predict the sensitivity. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, last part of my talk, I will talk about the extrinsic pathway and about uh, in uh, about cell death by the immune system, so uh, immunotherapy. So the extrinsic apoptotic pathway, which uh, as we've seen, is, in, is, in, is induced only by uh, be, by ligands of the death receptor, so death ligands, and it's also involved. Uh, let's remember how this happens: TNF or another. Uh, or trail or fast ligand activate um, uh, their receptors, which then trimerizes, oligomerizes, and then promotes um, oligomerization of multiple uh, molecules of caspase 8 and several other molecules that are in that complex. And this induces directly cleavage of caspase 3 or through the through bid activation of the mitochondrial pathway or both. So the death. Ligands and death receptors are, are proteins that are cytokines. They can be secreted, particularly TNF, but also TRAIL, they can be secreted. And they are involved in immune functions, not only in cell death by any means. So FAST, ligand, TNF, uh, TWIC, TRAIL, all of these are proteins of the TNF superfamily. Um, these are uh, the ligands and these are the receptors, which are part of the TNF superfamily receptors, which have a lot of different functions in, in the body, mostly related to immunity. Now, the pro-apoptotic uh, um, receptors of this family, for instance, in the case of TRAIL, or TRAIL R1 and TRAIL R2, also called DR2, DR4 and DR5, uh, in the case of TNF, we have uh, TNF receptor 1, but also a TNF receptor 2 that is not really pro-apoptotic uh, pro in general. 
and and fast. Now these ligands uh, can induce cell death, but they also can induce other outcomes. So they can induce cell death or they can induce inflammation or survival. We, we used to call this survival, but now it's becoming clear that the other signal that they induce is inflammation. So uh, fast ligand or TNF, this was the view in 2008. So I think 10 years later, we are viewing these as all the death ligands, fast ligand TNF and trail can induce either cell death or inflammation by aggregating the receptor and recruiting a series of molecules that could either lead directly to apoptosis or a, a lot of molecules, this is the hypersimplification of the receptor uh, that can uh, engage the NF-kappa B pathway and so inflammatory cytokines and also survival of the cell possibly. While the receptor is usually internalized, it can, uh, when it's internalized, usually the intracellular complexes uh, lead to apoptosis, but there are also intracellular complexes that lead to inflammation. So there's, uh, there's a complicated crosstalk between a lot of molecules that a number of researchers are trying to, to investigate to understand what makes the difference between uh, 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 one, these ligands inducing either cell death or inducing inflammation, but they do both in the body. So the physiological role of the extrinsic pathway is mostly in immune system homeostasis, and we'll see a lot of this uh, probably in, in further talks. Inflammatory signals, as I mentioned, e even proliferation. Caspase 8 is involved in lymphocyte proliferation, proliferation of the immune system. Uh, and also in killing uh, by the immune cells. So TRAIL is involved in the killing uh, by natural killer cells. And uh, all the death ligands are involved in the killing by CTL, by cytotoxic lymphocytes. Uh, so if this is a physiological role, we can imagine that there's a role for them in cancer. And indeed, uh, we have uh, 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 this uh, slide summarizes the strains capacity in cancer. What we know is that since they are involved in CTL-mediated killing, these ligands uh, and receptors are also involved in the evasion. Of the, of the tumor because natural killers and, and uh, CTLs are responsible for eliminating cancer cells when they can detect an antigen in the cancer cell. So they, the, they participate in elimination of uh, a tumor that expresses uh, MHCs or that uh, removes the MHCs in the, uh, they removes the MHC in the case of natural killers. So immune therapy relies a lot in, in death ligand and receptor um, interactions. We also know from all the animal models that even in Drosophila, you need a TNF homolog to keep epithelial tumors in check. So it's possible that the tumor evasion is something that is conserved in evolution and it has always existed in the case of immunity against cancer. Um, also, there are some uh, data that trail deficient mice can uh, undergo more cancer and possibly because of the role in, the, uh, in death by natural killers or also in CTLs. Now, this doesn't mean that we can use death ligands to kill a tumor. Uh, and this is something that has been studied for decades now and uh, everybody including myself uh, has tried to kill uh, cancer cells by employing a tnf like molecule in particular trail and uh, there's a, a huge number of groups trying to uh, develop ways to kill cancer cells using trail to sensitize cancer cells to trail because trail seem to be a very specific uh, uh, ligand that would trigger about doses in cancer, but not in non-cancer cells. This was uh, in the 20 years ago, approximately, and many pharmaceutical companies have developed drugs that are either recombinant trail, like uh, dilanamine, like uh, this recombinant uh, protein to kill, to treat cancer, or antibodies against DR5 or even DR4, 
uh, several of them in several flavors and varieties like trimerized, uh, single. And these ones have been useful in animal models of cancer. Now they have been going to clinical trials and each one of the clinical trials have failed. So even though a lot of groups are still working on, on trail against cancer, I can say that engaging these receptors with recombinant proteins uh, like recombinant trail, it, it just does not work against cancer. Um, there may be hope, uh, for instance, in liposomes that express trail, but so far this strategy simply doesn't work. And, and you'll see that we are, I think we're wasting a lot of resources in the cell death field trying to sensitize cells to, to these ligands because we just cannot use them against cancer, possibly because they're pro-inflammatory and because there are some, some uh, inflammatory in a, in a bad sense that they can also promote uh, proliferation in the tumor. I'm not gonna go into this, but there's a lot of data that suggests that these molecules can also stimulate proliferation of the cancer. Um, now there are other forms of cell, of cell death that have relevance to cancer. Um, you got, you're gonna have a, so several talks uh, soon tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and during the week about several forms of cancer. There's a lot of them. And um, some of them may have relevance uh, and some of them, they just have in vitro relevance. So um, there is senescence, which is not exactly a form of cell death, but it's definitely a form of keeping the cells inactive uh, forever. It's a break for oncogenic transformation because when you engage senes uh, when you hyperactivate uh, an oncogene, you, you have apoptosis or you also have senescence. And also senescence can occur when a cell divides more than it can uh, divide, uh, uh, allowing uh, what the telomeres uh, tel telomeres allow. So senescence is an irreversible um, cell cycle arrest, and you can see the stain in this. Uh, if you're curious about the effect of drugs that induce senescence in mesothelioma, you can go see this paper by uh, Eli Aliagas in the Nadal group. So this is a stain with beta-galactosidase. Uh, as you see, the senescent cells get flat, get this kind of fried egg morphology, and they stop growing. And they are active in the sense that they are alive, they're metabolically alive, and they secrete things. Uh, and they can be a target for natural killer cells. And there's a lot of data about whether senescent cells are pro or anti tumorogenic but uh, undoubtedly, they are a break for um, oncogenic transformation senescence. Now, um, um, there is a concept that goes also with the question before by Bruno about uh, whether we want to activate caspases. Now, the, the lab of Stephen Tate and other labs are actually arguing that perhaps what you want to do is to inhibit caspases for cancer. Why? Because when your uh, cell is beginning to die, it engages mitochondrial autopermobilization by the VCL2 family members. You can activate uh, caspases and the cell will go on immunosilent. This is apoptosis, right? Now, if you block apoptosis, the permeabilization of the mitochondria in this is inflammation. Uh, it leads to what we call caspase independent cell death and uh, there's activation by some of the proteins in here, such as MAC and other proteins. There's activation of nf b and of the gasting pathway by the mitochondrial DNA. So if you block caspases, uh, the apoptosis becomes an immunogenic type of cell death. And you have a, a, a whole talk about this in, in a couple of days. So this raises the question of should we kill cancer cells under caspase inhibited conditions and so induce CICD? And this is a, an a, a active uh, area of research. Should we have that caspase inhibitors to our therapy instead of trying to activate the caspases? Now, paroptosis, you will have a, a whole talk about, about this. Uh, and we know that it can happen. Um, 
in, in some settings of cancer, it's a form of cell death that is triggered by, by uh, stimuli that promote necrosis and in general by stress uh, related to, to uh, pathogens. And it's a very inflammatory form of cell death. And the interesting, about, uh, the interesting thing about pyroptosis is that there's a crosstalk with apoptosis. And so caspase 3 can uh, trigger a form of pyroptosis. So in response to chemotherapy, we can see in some cells that caspase 3, rather than promoting classical apoptosis, it promotes a pyroptotic-like cell death because it cleaves a protein called gastermin that uh, makes a pore. And so you can have a, a cell death that starts like apoptosis, but ends up like pyroptosis because it's pro-inflammatory. And this, uh, the, this would have to be studied much more, whether this has a role in, in cancer, but there are some evidences that it does. And I'm gonna finish with three slides about uh, in, immunotherapy and the immune cells in the immune evasion. So first to remind you, since you're immunologists, you know a lot about this, how CTLs uh, and natural killer kill cancer cells. This is a, a cytotoxic lymphocyte view of killing a cancer cell, a tumor cell. One here, another one is here. So in the cytotoxic lymphocyte, uh, there's induction of gene of proteins like trail and fast ligand, which are the death ligands, also TNF. And when the cytotoxic lymphocyte is activated by a dendritic cell, uh, it can be stimulated to kill a tumor cell. Um, it can be stimulated to kill and it does so by secreting granules. And what's uh, uh, in these granules? There's a, a lot of proteins that induce death of the target cell. Um, so here's the third apoptotic pathway that we've seen before that is uh, essential uh, all, and we forget about it. The third apoptotic pathway is the granzyme pathway. And granzyme is one of the proteins that can induce apoptosis in the target cell and lymphocytes can kill a tumor cell via granzyme. So there are many molecules in human hydrotoxic granules that induce apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis and some claim that even ferroptosis, which is another form of cell death that I haven't talked about. So the human um, CTLs and natural killers have an arsenal of weapons against uh, cancer cells. As far as they can detect it, and as far as they are not allergic uh, in the environment, they can induce cancer cell death in a variety of, of ways. So this is exploded by a new uh, explosive type of cancer therapy, explosive in the sense that the, the, there's so much research about it because it's really working and it's very impressive. So there are some uh, many types of immunotherapy. So there's adoptive cell transfer uh, works by transferring cells that usually come from the same patient and, they, um, and we can use that uh, lymphocytes from a patient and uh, amplify them in vitro and inject them back into the patient. Sometimes we can do this by re-engineering the TCR um, or by uh, engineering the cell to express a CAR T a molecule, which is an a hybrid between a, an antibody and a T cell receptor and uh, uh, we can inject it and it, it works. This therapy works. The STAR means that it's approved. It's approved and in use uh, against uh, some types of hematopoietic uh, tumors. There's also natural killer therapy that, that is being developed and uh, natural killers coming either from the, the patient, which is difficult to isolate or from cord uh, blood, they can kill uh, hematopoietic tumors. And uh, I encourage you to look at, the, at this article by Rea Martin Antonio, in which they, they examine very interesting ways, uh, besides the classical ways in which natural killer can kill infected cells, they can also kill multiple myeloma and, and other tumors. A second type of uh, immunotherapy is the cancer vaccine. Either we can 
uh, prevent the, the viruses to call transformation. And this is in use, as you know, for HPV and other tumor, uh, uh, the virus-induced tumors. And, and also therapeutic, this is un, uh, and still under investigation. It's about stimulating the immune system, for instance, with BCG or with a pa patient on dendritic cells, we can try to stimulate the immune system against, against the tumors from the patient. Third type of uh, immunotherapy is the one that is working most beautifully, uh, which is the checkpoint inhibitors. The checkpoint inhibitors, uh, what they do, PD-1 or PD-1 or anti-CTLA, is to uh, suppress the ways that the cancer cell is using to uh, block the immune system. And these are not only approved, but really are curing patients, and especially in lung cancer and in melanoma, it's an incredible, uh, it's incredibly how the, well they're working. There are also oncolytic viruses that are still in the development, but some of them are, are even approved for use in humans. And there are many targeted antibodies that can, that can engage, uh, that can inhibit uh, molecules in the cancer cell or that can direct the, the T cell towards the, the tumor. This sounds a little bit like science fiction and it's probably a very expensive kind of therapy, but uh, the fact is that some of these therapies are, are approved and this one in particular, checkpoint inhibitors are, are really working. So the immune, immune system can uh, kill a target cell. And uh, just uh, a brief mention that different forms of immunotherapy work better for solid tumors versus lymphoma. And the reason is not still clear, but um, CAR T cells work about B cell malignancies and other hematopoietic malignancies, while checkpoint inhibitors work better uh, against solid malignancies. It, 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 there's a lot of reasons. Um, lung cancer epithelial tumors have a lot of mutations, so they have a lot of antigens, while hematopoietic tumors have less antigens. And uh, if you want to read more about this, uh, take a look at our latest review in which we examine why we think uh, the, the mode of, of uh, T cell suppression is different, and this is why different types of tumor have uh, are killed better by one form of immunotherapy or the other. And I just want to leave you with a movie. Uh, well, you can, we can, we can take questions with a movie of the be beauty of how the immune cell can kill cancer cells. As you see here, these are immune cells that can attack uh, a, a cancer cell. In this case, it's a natural killer. Um, in this case, you can see movies of natural killers destroying cells that are infected by viruses. It's impressive how tiny the natural killer cells are and how big the target cells are and uh, they make a mess out of them. Here's an neurotrophy that is going to kill a small cell, which is a bacteria in this case, and they follow the bacteria around. Cancer cell, tiny CAR T cell, tiny CAR T cell moving around. It's moving around and it kissed this one and it killed it and it's gonna kiss this one and it's gonna kill it too. This is a super rapid cell death because it's all of it. Here's a cytotoxic cancer cell attacking, a cytotoxic T cell attacking a cancer cell. Here's another one. It recognizes it, kisses it, boom, it's gone. Beautiful. Well, okay, so as a summary of the talk, um, I've told you that overexpression of anti-apoptotic family members from more tumor formation, that cell death, and particularly apoptosis is involved in, in, in chemo and drug therapy. That cell death is the outcome of immunotherapy, that we can target directly the apoptotic machinery by uh, targeting BCL2 family proteins, 
and that we still don't know what's the best way to kill a cancer cell and we're working on this. And I want to thank uh, some movies, I don't know who the authors are. And uh, if you want to follow uh, uh, our lab, we are in Facebook and uh, I can't, I have to use the opportunity to show you this uh, conference that we're hopefully having at the end of November this year in Sitges in Spain. Thank you. More questions? All right, Chris. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, presentation and uh, the nice movies this, towards the end. Very beautiful image with, that made clear the importance of my very special cells at the moment, the CD8 uh, T cells. CD8 T cells is a lovely cell. Yeah. And uh, well, just starting with that, I'd like to uh, ask you to comment a couple of, of points. First of all, uh, apparently, I'd like you to, to confirm that all these checkpoint immunotherapy works better or only works if the solid tumor are infiltrated by CDAs. So this is one point that I'd like to hear from you. And the other thing is that uh, both you and Seamus uh, talked about the importance of granzyme B in inducing, you know, interfering, inducing the apoptosis program. Uh, so as being a very important part of the cytotoxic machinery. How does uh, granzyme B or granzyme A deficiency as well as perforin deficiency related to an in vivo uh, strong immune response against tumors or even pathogens? So what are the relative importance of granzymes and perforin? Thank you. I think the tumors have uh, such a huge arsenal to kill target cells, but I don't see any cases of uh, ground sign B deficiency. I really don't know about this. Um, maybe you know more, Gustavo? I, I, know you... that, I, I know that Joe Trapani and others uh, worked with, uh, with mice. Uh, I don't remember if there's any, anything transported to the humans. But uh, I think they studied granzyme A and granzyme B single and double mutants or deficient mice and then perforin. And uh, I don't really remember, you know, the final conclusion. I think Seamus uh, worked, worked more closely to that. He worked in granzyme for a while, yeah, but I don't yeah, that... yeah. in humans, I don't think this happens. No, yeah. so, I mean, there's two things there. Um, the perforin deficiency had a much bigger defect than any individual granzyme. Um, and you'd expect that because obviously there's a mo bunch of granzymes and we have to remember as well that mouse and human granzymes are quite different. There's a very different repertoire of human versus mouse granzymes. So it's not easy to translate across the murine studies. That, that's, that's one thing. But the per there's no question the perforin deficient mice had a much bigger deficiency in killing cells than any of the individual granzymes. The other issue I think is that um, most of those studies were done, um, you know, using much more primitive tumor killing models. I'm not sure whether that work has been revisited in the last say five or, five or so years, we're using more sophisticated, um, you know, genetically defined models of cancer. A lot of them were kind of xenograph studies and so on that I think are, are maybe a little less relevant. So. I think the big problem is um, we, we don't really know what the actual defect is of using, for example, granzyme B deficient mice or granzyme A deficient mice in genetically defined tumor models, at least that I'm aware of. I don't think these studies have been done in recent years, especially in the context of checkpoint inhibitors, plus or minus checkpoint inhibitors, because I think that's where you'd see the real defect. Once you can, you, you open up the tumor to attack using checkpoint inhibition, I think now it would tease out, you know, the, the whether or not there's a major defect in loss of granzyme B or perfum and so on. But I think the, the slide that Christina showed there earlier, and I mentioned, I think CTLs and NKs have, have multiple kind of almost parallel or redundant killing mechanisms available to them that maybe it'd be quite difficult to see 
you know, a major deficiency. If you have CTLs or NKs that are deficient in fast ligand or TNF ligand or Granzan B or perforin. What's come out from CRISPR studies in the last couple of years, um, actually Connor Kearney, uh, you know, who graduated from my lab a few years ago, working um, uh, with actually Dr. Pani, um, published a very nice paper on doing in vivo um, CRISPR-based analysis of what kind of knockouts allow escape tumor immunization. And, and one of the surprises was actually loss of TNF receptor was actually, a, you know, a big selective factor. Um, so I think TNF itself uh, is an important mechanism of CTL or NK killing. Um, and but, uh, no. recently even fast ligand has been seen to participate in the death by CAR T, even in bystander cells not even in the target cell. So if you ha don't have a mechanism, really we have evolved to kill uh, infected cells in so many different ways that uh, the lack of one of them is not gonna, not allow the, the, the T cells to, to target them. Now, if the, tum if the tumor expresses PDL1 or the other ones, then that, that's a different issue. Karina, I think Karina has. One Wait a last minute, question. please. Yes, the I think the last question um, is to Seamus uh, regarding. So you mentioned several cytokines that work as dense. I IL, have uh, thirty three and thirty six. ATP release is a physiological process and it seems uh, to act as that when in high concentration. Do you know if it is the same for this cytokine? Anna Julia Petrovo, let's ask it. Yeah, I think ATP works mainly by triggering the process of cells. You know what I mean? So ATP at high concentration has been reported to act as a damp, but I mean, if you look at the way it works, it seems to work through triggering, for example, IL-1 beta release. So I don't think ATP in of itself is a damp. I think it triggers damp release, um, you know? So um, yeah, so that would be my response to that. So, and in the context of uh, tumor progression, I am so curious about um, the, the, the differential impact of inflammation depending on the type of tumor. So, uh, some tumors are susceptible to paraptosis and uh, inflammasomes, and others are so resistant so uh, the inflammation um, acts uh, as, uh, how can I say, friends, so uh, leading to tumor progression. Why? Do you have I, an idea? Of I think... Screen? Sorry. Christina's... Back. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll answer first. It was about the issue of um, why inflammation um, is, is facilitates clearance of certain tumors, um, but benefit to the tumors. I think it's two things. I think the quality of inflammation, um, the type of inflammation, is is one thing, because of course we often forget that you know inflammation is involved in you know this kind of aggressive um, you know bug clearing mode, if you like, or um, recognition of non-self and then attacking it. But then another aspect of inflammation is wound healing. And of course, many tumors harness the wound healing type of inflammation, um, you know, because of course, wound healing is associated with producing of, of proliferation inducing cytokines and, and anti-inflammatory or anti-immune attack uh, cytokines. I think, I think that's one issue that the type of inflammation that's being induced. But I think another issue also is um, the, the tumor burden, sorry, the mutation burden of the tumor. We now know from genomics analysis that, you know, some tumors have like 250 mutations, another have like 10,000 mutations. 
So if you have a very high mutation burden in the tumor, there's a lot of neoepitopes. And if you break tolerance, there's a lot to attack there. And so a strong inflammatory response, you know, means you can potentially clear the tumor because there's lots of non-self there. So you've got the kind of danger signal or the damp and you've got a non-self antigen. But if you think of a tumor with a, a very low um, antigen burden itself, so even if you, even if you actually, you know, effectively induce a strong inflammatory response, what are you attacking? You know, there's, there's nothing to clear. If it's a type of tumor that has a, a low mutation burden, there just may not be any strong neoepitopes there. So you, you may activate the immune system, but to what end? You know, what, how, how can it discriminate between the tumor and non-transformed tissue if the, the mutation burden is very low? So I think one of the, re I, th I think, um, like for example, it's been shown that lung cancers have an extremely high mutation burden. And maybe that's why they are one of the tumor types that benefit a lot from checkpoint inhibition. Because once you remove that kind of tolerizing signal, there's a lot of new epitopes uh, to recognize. So it may be that a strong inflammatory response will work the best in a, in a tumor that has thousands of mutations, but maybe not so much in a tumor that has very low rates of mutation. So I think in leukemias and lymphomas, typically, I think the mutation loads are much lower. They're very often caused by, you know, single, uh, not, not exclusively caused by, but they're very often associated with major single driver oncogenes like in CML. Um, you know, of course they've acquired other mutations, but it's a very different beast to uh, a lung cancer. So that would be my tuppence worth. Chris, you want to add something? Nope. She's tired. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, you want to wrap up, Ricardo, this session? Yeah, I'd like to thank Chris, Seamus, for the amazing talks. Um, and uh, we are going to be back tomorrow at 8. Same place, same time. Uh, we wait you there. Thank you, guys. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much again. We'll you be watching. Are, uh, I'll be watching. More than like spectacular scientists, you are buddies. And uh, I think I must mention that, uh, you know, the whole program, uh, I've been, uh, you know, protagonized by friends, very dear friends that spare time and energy to communicate excellent science and concepts to all of us. Um, also, just a final uh, remind, I think, because we had uh, a little bit of trouble between one uh, talk and the other. So I would ask all the students and people interested in the, the, the talks that uh, whenever we finish, you just copy a link, close your, your window, and then, uh, you know, restart it, I think, the, the YouTube. I think it's going to be easier for you guys to get back to the talks. Okay, so see you all uh, tomorrow at 8. Thank you, Shay. Thank you, Chris, very yeah. much. Thank you, Shay, Chris. Ciao.